praying for our city and our region. We should be praying for souls. I don't know about you, but I want more souls saved around us. I don't want to just play church. Glory to God. Well, turn with me in your Bibles. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2. I know we've been camping out over here. We're going to uh, revisit a few things. But tonight I'm going to call this message The Spirit-Filled Life. The Spirit-Filled Life. And folks, just tonight, we're gonna just start to scratch the surface of what it means to be a spirit-filled believer. Folks, we cannot have a cheap or a shallow or an incomplete definition of what it means to be spirit-filled. If we're not careful, we'll think that spirit-filled just means that we're louder than other Christians, you know, or it'll it'll just mean that we're more willing to dance, you uh, you know, that we're just not stuffy. Well, how many of you know you can be that way just in your own personality? You know, praise God for joy. Praise God for, you know, liberty and and times of refreshing. But folks, being a spirit-filled believer goes so much further than just being willing to be demonstrative, you know, in a service. Because if we're not careful, we'll be shouters, we'll be praisers. We could even be, you know, the first to get up and and, and demonstrate excitement. But how many of you know you got to have real character at home? you got to be living this life. For God, and we're going to start getting into the Bible definition of the spirit filled life. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2. We've been hanging out over here. Go to verse 13. And you remember Jeremiah was dealing with a backslidden Israel. And God tells them here in Jeremiah 2.13, He says, Because my people have committed two evils. Everyone say two evils. It says, Number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And two, they have hewed themselves out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And remember, a cistern is something that they would collect rainwater, they would save it up for the dry season. How many of you know God's not talking about the rainwater here? He's talking about their spiritual condition. And what they were trying to do is that they were trying to live off the spirituality of the past. You know, they were trying to live off the faithfulness of last week or last month or last year. Folks, how many of you know God does not want us living on our past faithfulness? He says, you've forsaken me, the fountains of living water. A fountain of living water is something that you have to go to every single day. We've got to have a fresh and living daily relationship with the Lord. If we're not careful, we will remember a time in our past where we prayed every day and we read the Bible every day and we were excited for God and we served in the church and we did all this stuff. And if we're not careful, we will just lean upon that past faithfulness. God is not so much interested in what you did last year. He's interested in what you're doing today. Now, of course, the Bible tells us that God's faithful. He's not going to forget your faithfulness of the past. But I'm just saying you cannot live off what you did last year. Amen. And see, Israel was just trying to live off their tradition. They were just trying to live off the fact that they were the people of God. They had the covenant of God. And therefore, it didn't matter what they did. Well, folks, if we're not careful, we will try to live out of cisterns. A cistern was just something they turned to when times got tough. And remember, you can go over to verse 27 there, Jeremiah 2, 27. It says, saying to a stock, now this is talking about the little trinkets and idols and the little good luck charms that Israel was turning to. And God is saying, this is what Israel was saying to these these things, saying to a stock, you are my father, and to a stone, you have brought me forth. And then God now turns and starts talking about his people. He says, for they have turned their back unto me and not their face, but in the time of their trouble, they say, arise, Lord, and save us. See, Israel was only turning to God when they had troubles or hardships and they started to develop this habit of thinking that God was only there to be called upon when things were bad. He said, no, that's just trying to live out of a cistern. A cistern is something you turn to when all of a sudden there's no no other water to be found. God does not want the trouble call only, amen? He wants you in fellowship every single day, day in and day out, amen? Praise the Lord. And then in verse 28 there, he says, where are those gods that you turn to? Where are all these other things that have distracted you? He says, see if, turn to them and see if they'll arise and save you, right? And so we saw that. Now go over to chapter four. And verse 1, 
And then God gave them instruction, what we've been talking about these last couple of services. Over there in Jeremiah 4.1, he says, if you will return, O Israel, saith the Lord, he says, return to me. God is still wanting them to come back, all right? The good news is if you still got a heartbeat in your chest, you know, and you got air in your lungs, God is, his mercy is still there. He says, you can still come back. He says, and if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be removed. And he says, and you shall swear or shall answer, the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. The Lord's saying, you know, go ahead and just turn to me, put these abominations away from yourself, and watch the blessings start to move into your life. Amen. Stop living out of the cisterns. Start living with a daily relationship with the Lord and watch his blessings start to show up. He says in verse three, for thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, and these were the three instructions we looked at. Number one, he says, break up your fallow ground or you've got to make sure to cultivate uh, 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 you know, and prepare your heart to, to uh, break up fallow ground means to literally tender, uh, make tender the ground or soften the ground so it can receive seed so it can grow a harvest. The word fallow ground means useless ground. He said, break up the uselessness, right? And start coming before me and uh, making yourselves tender before me. And then he says, and sow not among thorns. Obviously, we cannot grow a harvest if our heart is not prepared, right? Amen, we were talking about this. And now verse four, and this is kind of where we're gonna launch from here tonight. He says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. How many of you know he's not talking about the natural process? Of circumcision. He says, and take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings, right? He says, circumcise your heart before the Lord. And remember, we talked about this. Circumcision here is a reference to stubbornness, or our own personal insistence, or our own preferences. Folks, if you're gonna get tender before God, you're gonna have to go before him and lay down your preferences. You're gonna have to lay down your will, your feelings, amen, if you're gonna hear his voice correctly. But we're gonna kinda launch into this now. He says, circumcise your heart, or literally, uh, cut your heart before God. Cut your heart before God. Remove that stubbornness. Remove your personal insistence. Remove what you think is right and start seeking his will. Amen. And so we're gonna talk about being circumcised in heart. Go with me over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, and we're gonna build into the New Testament here. Go to Ezekiel 36. Praise the Lord. How many of you know that the Bible prophesied a time when God would give us a new spirit? He would give us a new heart. What does it mean to be circumcised in heart? We're gonna talk about this. We're just gonna use some scriptures to prove it. Go to Ezekiel 36 and go to verse 25. This is a prophecy about what God would do for us through Jesus Christ. And he prophesied this to Israel that there was coming a day when he was truly gonna cleanse them and he was gonna give them a new heart and a new spirit. Ezekiel 36, 25, God speaking to them again, he says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now, Let's go ahead and read the rest of the passage and then we'll come back up. He says, a new heart also will I give to you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Or literally a modern translation says, I will take away your heart of stone and give you a soft, tender heart. Or God is saying, I will put within you a heart that is cut or tender, all right? And then he says in verse 27, he says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Folks, go back up to verse 25. 
when this is the prophecy of what God would do through the Messiah when he was crucified. How many of you remember when Jesus was on the cross and they came around to check whether or not he was still alive? And remember, they were gonna break his legs, but of course, the prophecy said that his bones would not be broken. And so instead, one of those Roman soldiers did what? They speared him in the side. And the Bible says that something flowed out. What flowed out of Jesus? Water, you're right. Water, you know, uh, came out. And that was the clean water by which all of us are cleansed. Of course, his blood as well. All right, and so it says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness. We've been cleansed from the filthiness of sin. We've been cleansed from the filthiness of idols. Amen, glory to God. And then verse 26, he says, a new heart I will give you and a new spirit. Hallelujah. I will take out that heart of stone and I will put within you a tender heart. All right, again, another reference to the circumcision of the heart. What does this mean? He is gonna, he has, right now, we are those that have received his spirit. We've received a new heart, a new spirit, amen. And we are now drawn to do the, the plan of God. We are drawn to do his commandments. We are drawn to do his judgments and his statutes, amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you know that when he put his spirit within us, he was giving us a brand new instinct? He was giving us a brand new instinct. You know, I was, you know, meditating on this uh, weeks and weeks ago, and I was looking for the word to describe it. And then I was in Tennessee a few weeks ago with Reverend Greer, and he started talk about, uh, talking about meditating in the word, and he then you know, use the term, uh, uh, the instinct of God. And when I heard that, I knew that's exactly it. That's what I've been looking for, a way to describe what it means when God lives on the inside of you. It's like he gave us a brand new instinct. He gave us a new instinct. You know, and then he went, Reverend Greer went on to use this illustration of this bird that flies from Alaska all the way to New Zealand, non-stop. It is called, what was that thing called? A bar-tailed godwit is the name of that bird. It literally is the the longest solo flying bird in in the world. It will fly 8,500 miles over a course of nine or 10 days. It never stops, it never rests, it flies that long. How does it know how to go from Alaska to New Zealand, right? The Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. God put an instinct in that bird to return back to New Zealand and return back to Alaska. No one told him how to do it. He's just drawn to it. He's drawn to it. And Reverend Greer said something interesting. How does that bird do that? Because no one told him that he can't. No one told him that he can't do it, right? And I started to realize, you know, that's exactly what God put in us. He put an instinct. He put something in us to draw us to his will, draw us to his plan. Folks, do you know what I'm talking about? When you've got a tender cut heart with God, you're just constantly drawn back to him. There's an instinct in you. You're you're, you're drawn back to prayer. You're drawn back to the word of God. You know, uh, even when you see yourself start to get distracted with other things, like, oh, wait a minute, I gotta get back. You know, something just is constantly bringing you back. And you're not fully happy or satisfied until you are following his perfect will in your life. I don't know about you, but the moment I step just an inch out of the will of God, I know it and there's something always pulling and drawing me back there. That's what it means to have a cut heart. Amen. Amen. Something is drawing us from the inside, always drawing us back to him, always drawing us back to his ways. Praise the Lord. You know, something always drawing me and letting me know this word is truth. Always something working within me that no matter, you know, how things are going financially, I'm going to be a tither no matter what. No matter how things are going in the circumstances in my life, I'm always going to be praising him no matter what. 
Amen. You know, if you've ever uh, gotten distracted or too busy, all of a sudden there's something drawing you away from those distractions and calling you back. Amen. Yes, it's because we've been cut in our heart. You know, when we uh, uh, know in our lives when we need to make changes or we need to do something different and we need to stay faithful, or what keeps us coming back to serve in the same post at church over and over, right? That's because we have a God-given instinct. When he gave us that new spirit, he put something on the inside of us that is always pulling on us, always drawing upon us. Do you feel that every single day? Yeah. Folks, and I'm not saying it's, it's not guilt, it's not self-condemnation, but there's like, and the way I've described it before, and I know it almost sounds really negative, and I don't mean it in a scary sense. I just mean it that it's always following me. It's like haunting me. I don't know how to describe it, and that word haunting is usually used in a very negative sense. But I just mean it in the sense that God, God's spirit, you know, is just always, always there. You know, there's always this draw. If I get you know, a little too far over here, too far over there, there's always this instinct to get back. Folks, that's what it means to have a new heart within you. That's what it means to have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You are never going to be satisfied and happy until you're doing fully what God has called you to do, being faithful to Him. Amen. What is that? That's, because that's that cut. That's that circumcision of the heart. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. When you walk out of love and you say something sharp to your spouse and something draws you to forgive and you know you just can't keep going in your day until you ask their forgiveness. Do you know what I'm talking about? What is that? That's because you're cut in the heart. You have a new, a new heart, a new spirit. Go to Romans chapter two. Let me show you this in the New Testament. Romans chapter two. Glory to God. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it makes a whole lot of sense to you. But it makes a whole lot of sense to me. There's an instinct. You know, when you start talking to somebody, you know, that they don't know Jesus, all of a sudden something just kind of clicks on the inside of you. It's like all of a sudden there becomes a little mission on the inside to get them saved. What is that? You've got a new spirit within you. Amen. Glory to God. You know, I tell you what, you know, it's not my natural personality to, to shout and to lift hands and things like that, but I'm drawn to it. I'm drawn to it. I'm just using, when I say I, I'm just talking about proverbially. You know what I mean? This should uh, be all of us. Go to Romans chapter two in verse 28. Go to Romans two, verses 28 and 29. The New Testament tells us the exact same thing. It says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. You know, Paul, the apostle here, he's saying, listen, the circumcision that God commanded the Jews to do, it had nothing to do with a natural procedure or a ritual. Verse 29, he says, but he is a Jew. And the word Jew here is kind of being used uh, loosely, uh, synonymous with the word believer. It's not just talking about just the nationality of being Jewish. It's talking about believing or being one of God's people. But you could, you could say it this way. But he is a believer, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. That of the heart in the spirit. So literally the Bible is saying that we get circumcised in our spirit. There's something, there's a cut there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God gave us a new heart, a tender heart. Took the one of stone out, that stubborn, disobedient heart, and now we have a tender heart. Tender heart. Say, Pastor, what does this have to do with being spirit-filled? You will see. He says, and circumcision is that of the heart of your human spirit, and it is not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. See, the Jews, they took great pride saying, oh, I'm a circumcised Jew the eighth day. And they took great pride in their nationality, their great pride as being, you know, part of the nation of God. But Paul's saying, hey, listen, it's not just, you know, some outward pride. It's about having a tender heart. Amen. Glory to God. Now, go to Acts chapter one, and now we're gonna start talking about what this means. To be spirit-filled. I'm telling you, if you are spirit-filled, 
And, you know, if you say you're a spirit-filled Christian, you, have may, you may have been in a service where someone, you know, laid hands on you. You may have even spoken in tongues. But all of a sudden, your heart has gone cold and hard. I'll tell you what, then you're not living the spirit-filled life. The spirit-filled life is a tender-heartedness before God. A spirit-filled life is a life that says, I'm never going to be happy until I'm fully yielded to God's plan in my life. Go to Acts chapter, where did I tell you? Go to Acts chapter one. Go over to Acts chapter one and verse four. Now, we're gonna start looking at the promise of being spirit-filled. And we're gonna start looking at the elements that should be consistent in the life of a spirit-filled believer. I don't know about you, I wanna be a true spirit-filled believer. How about you? Hmm. You don't want to just have a tradition. You don't want to just have a routine. Amen. Now this is talking about Jesus with his disciples. And it says, And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them. Everyone say commanded. Amen. He didn't say, it doesn't say suggested. Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which Jesus says, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. This is the words of Jesus. John the Baptist baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. When they therefore were come together, they asked of Jesus saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Here they were more interested in political things. Boy, we see that even in the days that we live in. The church is so wound up. When are we going to realize that our deliverance is not a political deliverance? They're like, well, okay, when are you going to finally make, so we can overthrow this wicked government of the Romans? Listen, wicked government is nothing new for the people of God. From Pharaoh all the way up to, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar all the way into the 20th century to Hitler and to several of the U.S. presidents. Evil government is nothing new to the people of God. Stop thinking that your answers and your blessing comes from whoever's in office. Yes, we might have preferences, and those preferences could even be God's preferences. However, Jesus did not give their question any credence. He did not even deal I mean, we're talking about the Caesars of Rome who were about to burn Christians at the stake. And Jesus passed it off. Not that he passed off, you know, the suffering of his people. But he's just saying political things. Look what he says. And Jesus said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Notice he talked about the political circumstances. He said there are times and seasons. There's times and seasons. And what do you know about seasons? They change. He said, you're going to go through times of evil government over you. You're going to go through times when the government over you is going to be better than than other times. He said, but it is not for you to know when those things change. But he does say in verse 8, but you shall receive power. Everyone say power. power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So notice the power of the Holy Ghost is not found in political things. He says, it's not for you to know the times and seasons of the political changes. He says, but you should walk in heavenly power, the kingdom of God kind of power. Stop being so wound up about the kingdoms of men. I tell you what, if we could get the Christian church in America to be more interested in the kingdom of God than they are the kingdoms of men, the, the, whoever's president, that's just the kingdoms of men. Whatever China's up to, whatever Russia's up to, those are the kingdoms of men. Amen. You need to be more uh, uh, you know, focused on the power which comes from heaven. He says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be political scientists predicting every political election to your preference and benefit. Oh, wait, am I reading that wrong? <laughs> but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and, to the un, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, regardless of who's in political power. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. All right. 
Now go back up there to verse 4. Notice Jesus commanded them to wait for the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father is what? The baptism of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 5. Jesus is speaking. He says, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Notice Jesus is quoting what John the Baptist said. Jesus is quoting Matthew 3, 11, and 12. So let's hold our place here in Acts 1, go over to Matthew chapter 3, and let's look again at what John said we would receive. <laughs> I haven't got to my point yet here. I'm building it up. Building it up. Glory to God. So Jesus is directly connecting the promise of the Holy Ghost to what John said back here in Matthew 3.11. This is the words of John. This is what Jesus just quoted. John says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Notice you can have something that John the Baptist never had. Think about what's available to us in these days and times. He said the, the, the ministry of Jesus is to fill you, to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Notice verse 11 it keeps on going. Notice the colon at the end. Look at uh, uh, verse 12. He's still speaking of Jesus who would baptize you with, with the Holy Ghost. What will the baptism of the, of the Spirit do? It says, whose fan is in his hand. It means when Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Ghost, it says that he has a fan in his hand. Or maybe we would say this, bellows. Do you know what bellows are? Bellows are to stoke the fire. Bellows are to make the fire burn hotter. What does this unquenchable fire do? And Jesus will what? Thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Here's the part of the spirit-filled life that we never get to hear about. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, notice there's two things the Spirit is going to do in your life. He's going to gather the fruitfulness and burn up the uselessness. He is going to gather up fruitfulness. That's what it means. He says he's going to gather wheat, but he's also going to burn the chaff. When it says that Jesus is going to purge his floor, that is literally a reference to our hearts and our lives that he will literally, the, the spirit-filled life, here we go, it's not just who can dance the loudest, you know, praise the loudest, shout the loudest. It's not about just who's first to take a run around the room, though that does not have to be excluded, you understand? But the spirit-filled life is when the fire of God burns deep within your character, deep within your heart, and you challenge what is in there, things that are useless, things that are against God, things that you know, uh, distract us. He starts to work on those things to burn it up. He starts saying, I'm here to make, I'm going to fill you with my spirit. I'm going to baptize you with my spirit because I want to gather fruitfulness out of your life and I want to burn up uselessness in your life. Oh my goodness. That's what a spirit-filled life it looks like. That's what it is here to do. And so now go back to the book of Acts. I haven't even brought up my first point yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go over there to Acts 1-4. Jesus commanded them to wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And what will the Holy Ghost do? He will purge his floor. He will gather up fruitfulness and he will burn up uselessness. That is what we should be after, brothers and sisters, when you have a tender heart before God, Father, I just want to be fruitful. I want to be fruitful. Whether I'm out in front or, or if I'm serving over here, if I'm behind the scenes, I just want to be fruitful. Glory to God. Anything that's useless in my life, 
Lord, burn it up. Burn it up. And this is where Christians, they do not want this aspect of the Holy Ghost. They do not open up their lives to the Holy Ghost to, for them to truly see what in their lives needs to go. It might be things that you think are even from God. It could be things that you just think are, 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 are there for you to you know, consume upon your lusts. And again, God's gonna give you nice things. God's a, a blessing. But do you bring your life before him and say, Father, anything in this life that is not of you, burn it up. Burn it up. Take my intentions. Take my preferences. Take what it is that I either enjoy or the things I'm called to do or not to do. Anything that's not of you, burn it up. Burn it up. And I'll tell you what, Christians do not like to give up things. They do not like to give up things. But I'll tell you what, if the Spirit shows you that it's gotta go, then he's gonna promote you. He's gonna promote you. Amen. He says, for John truly baptized you with water, but I'm gonna baptize, with you, baptize you in the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And then verse six, like I said, they came together. They asked of Jesus saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Notice if they were gonna get too political, the power was going to be hindered in their life. Do you see that? If they had this, their personal preference is Lord, Make a news headline. Lord, deliver us from this political party. Deliver us from these evil Romans. Make us, you know, make us separate. Give us the government we've always wanted. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know those things. But it is for you to know the power of the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. The filling of the Spirit does these two things. Produces fruitfulness and burns up uselessness. Right? That new spirit in us, that new heart, that new instinct is always driving us to be fruitful and to toss away that which is useless in our lives. Folks, that does not mean you can't have something nice. That doesn't mean you can't have something fun. It just means that your heart is open and willing to be you know, purged no matter what it is. Oh, glory to God. And now, verse seven, Jesus says, it's not for you to know. He says, but you shall receive power. He's saying your power isn't gonna come from politics. Your power isn't gonna come from those who are in office. Your power is gonna come from the Holy Ghost. Your power is gonna come from heaven. He says, and after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be what? Witnesses. Here's the number one aspect of the spirit-filled life. Are you ready? It is not how much money you're gonna get. It is not gonna be whether you, you know, uh, fulfill your dreams in life of everything you want to have. I'm here to tell you that the number one aspect of a spirit-filled life is this, kingdom-mindedness. Kingdom-mindedness. As soon as, Jesus says, as soon as the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you are gonna be demonstrators of my kingdom. And the first thing that is gonna come into your spirit when you are a spirit-filled believer is a desire to win lost souls. And if you don't care about the lost, you cannot be a spirit-filled believer. If that is not your first and foremost and highest priority, you cannot be a spirit-filled believer. You can speak in tongues all you want. Every, every big name minister can lay hands on you and you can speak in tongues and pray in tongues for hours a day. But if you go out and never lead someone to Jesus, I'm gonna question whether or not you're spirit filled. Because we think, well, it's just, see, you can try to live, God doesn't live on the technicalities. There's gonna have to be that intangible spirit of God that is on the inside of you that draws you to the lost, that gives you compassion and that you want to see the kingdom of God grow more than you want to see your kingdom grow. He says, if you're going to be kingdom-minded, you're not going to be able to build your own kingdom. Praise the Lord. Why is so much of what we call the spirit-filled body of Christ today, they're out building their own kingdoms. They're building their own kingdoms. It's about how much money they get, 
what kind of vehicle they have, you know, uh, uh, how much it costs, uh, how big their house is, all this stuff. God's not against you having something nice. God's not against you having a big house. But I'm telling you, he is against you building your own kingdom. Are you here tonight? If you're truly spirit-filled, you need to look for that kingdom-mindedness. You know, folks, and I'm here tonight, and I see many of you, many of you that are kingdom-minded. You tell me all the time, oh, pastor, you know, I reached out. You know, uh, I witnessed to this person. This person accepted Jesus Christ. You know, I'm praying for my neighbor, or I've got a sibling or a family member that I'm praying for and I'm witnessing to. You're just always consumed with the thought of others. That's because you're spirit-filled. Glory to God. Glory to God. In verse 8, Jesus says, you'll receive not the power of an earthly political kingdom. You will receive power directly from heaven. You will receive the power of the kingdom of God all for what? To be what? Witnesses. Witnesses. So what are you as a spirit-filled believer? You are a demonstrator of God's kingdom. People will look upon you and they will see God's kingdom on your life. Right? Remember when it said when Jesus cast out the demon out of that boy over there in Mark chapter 9? And remember in, in other places it says he cast out those demons with his word. And he says if indeed I cast out demons by the spirit of God. He says the kingdom of God has come near unto you. In the same way people should have an experience or they should, you know, come close to the kingdom of God when they see you in their life. Amen. But if we're not careful, the modern day church thinks we're supposed to be building our own kingdom. Folks, we're not building our own kingdoms. Amen. You don't build your own kingdom. You don't build your own ministry. You don't build your own manifestation, so to speak. Build his kingdom. See, now I'm not going to take all the time. But we see the spirit-filled life so active in these early chapters of the book of Acts. From chapter 2, from the beginning of chapter 2, all the way through the end of chapter 5, I just made a list of several things that we see in those chapters of Acts. You know, first of all, in chapter 2, we see, you know, the, the, the 120 in the upper room, they get filled with the Holy Ghost, and immediately, what do they do? They stand up. Peter stands up and preaches a sermon on salvation. The first thing that they demonstrated was a heart to win the lost. Souls were saved. A deep-seated heart for the lost became evident. People were then filled with the Holy Ghost. Other people were filled by the Spirit because they saw these individuals. People were miraculously healed. Thousands joined the church, right? Believers were thrown in prison only to be released and they came back to their own company and just lifted their voice and started praising God. Oh my goodness, they never once questioned if God left them because they were cast into prison. Never once. They said, we're just gonna keep on praising God. The modern day Christian would sit there, wait a minute, this bad thing happened to me. Well, God must have left me. My faith must not have worked. Folks, you're going to go through a lot of challenging times. God didn't go anywhere. The word didn't go anywhere. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Yeah. We see in the early chapters in chapter 4, well, in chapter 3, we see, you know, Peter raise up the man that was crippled from birth. We see uh, uh, people that are being healed in Peter's shadow. We see, you know, believers in Acts chapter 4 that are selling their possessions just to provide for their brothers and sisters in Christ around them. They're detached from their own plans and their own belongings. They're giving to those in need. They're serving one another. The Bible says that they were eating their, their food with uh, joy and singleness of heart. We don't see from Acts chapter 2 all the way to the end of Acts chapter 5, we never hear one complaining Christian. We don't see anyone ever getting mad at one another. And nobody is offended with anybody. Not one uh, example of someone get, getting offended or complaining or getting upset with one another. Why is this? Because when you're filled with the Spirit and you're building God's kingdom, you're not going to get offended. 
Why is this? Because when you build God's kingdom, you are not going to get offended. You are gonna be so consumed on having what God wants, nothing's gonna offend you. Why? Because offense is always the byproduct of building your own kingdom. When you're building your own kingdom and you want things your way, you want it the way you want it, you're gonna get offended. You'll start insisting on your own needs. You'll start insisting on your own preferences. People get offended out of jealousy, greed, a lack of walking in love. None of that happens in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5. Nobody complains. Nobody gets offended. Nobody is upset, right? Obviously, you have Ananias and Sapphira. They lied, and of course, they fell under judgment, right? And then you see in chapter 6, go over there to chapter 6. Oh, praise the Lord. See, when you are spirit-filled, you are so consumed with building God's kingdom, you're not offended when somebody steps in, in your way to build your own. I, there's no, I want to be that person that, I, you know, that we're easy going, easily to be entreated, the Bible says. Low maintenance. Why? Because if something gets in the way of my own kingdom, who cares? I'm not here to build my own kingdom. Look at Acts chapter six, and then we see the first, the first evidence of somebody complaining. Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't complain. They lied and fell dead. <laughs> That's one way to keep the church clean. <laughs> oh. Look at chapter six and verse one. And so at this point now, people have been saved and thousands have been healed and there's been uh, thousands added to the church. Now, the church had grown from 120 to thousands in a short matter of time. And it says in, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. Isn't that awesome? The Bible didn't call them just believers. He said the number of disciples multiplied. I love that. That sounds like a strong church. They weren't just there as believers. They were there as students. That's what the word disciple means. When the number of the students were multiplied, there arose a murmuring, which means complaining, of the Greeks against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Oh, no. Now we see the first evidence of complaint and somebody being disgruntled. Why? Because all of a sudden, their needs aren't being met. Somebody was overlooked. Somebody was missed. Folks, what are you gonna do when you get overlooked? What are you gonna do in the house of God when you get overlooked? What are you gonna do in the house of God when your needs go unmet? What are you gonna do when the pastor doesn't call you back on time? That's happened. I, I, I get a lot of calls. I try to get back to everybody. There's times it takes days. You know, and that's why I just say, you know, uh, you know, God has a phone number too. It's Jeremiah 33, three. Call unto me and I will answer. <laughs> That's what he says. Call unto me and I'll answer. And I, I really should start asking people, before you call me, did you call him? Did you call him? <laughs> He's your answer before I am, just so you know. So what are you gonna do when you get overlooked or you get neglected in the daily ministration? What are you gonna do when you get your feelings hurt? What are you gonna do when you get emotional? Here we have hurt feelings from the believers. And look at how the apostles handled it. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. <laughs> the apostle said, as church leadership, I'm not gonna go around and handle all the complaints. The apostle said, we are not the complaint department. He says, wherefore, brethren, Look you out among you, seven men of what? Honest report and what? Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom who we may appoint over this business. And this was the election of the seven deacons. Stephen was one of them, right? Remember Stephen is one of them. Philip, the evangelist, is one of them. Remember this, right? Well, praise the Lord. And he says, make sure you find men that are honest, 
full of the spirit and full of wisdom that we may appoint over this business. Notice the complainers didn't get promoted. Notice God said, okay, if I'm gonna put leadership in place over those that feel neglected or offended, I'm gonna put somebody over them who's full of the spirit. Because God's saying, if, if I'm going to take them from a place of being their own kingdom-minded, I've got to put an example over them that they see these seven men who are God's kingdom-minded. Yeah, right. Amen. Yeah. Kingdom-mindedness. You know, I thought it's just very interesting when the apostles saw these complainers, he didn't run out. They didn't run out, you know, as the, 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 the ministers and try to just, oh, 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 you know. Try to play all diplomat. They said, we'll put somebody over you who will be an example, who is not, you know, uh, kingdom-minded for themselves. They're kingdom-minded for God. Amen. <laughs> Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Folks, you want to be promoted with God? Start building his kingdom. You want to be used by God? Start building his kingdom around you everywhere you go. Lead people to Jesus. Bring people to church. If God's going to use you, if God's going to promote you, he's going to see how kingdom-minded are you going to be. Our time is just about gone. And so that's just kind of scratching the surface. You know, and we see this back in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you shall be witnesses. People will mean something to you. The lost will be upon your heart. Don't think that this spirit-filled life is about God giving you uh, uh, this, this need uh, and this uh, desire for you know, finances and your own stuff and just making you the loudest shouter or the quickest runner and all this stuff. When you're spirit filled, look deep within you and you'll find a desire to win the lost. And if it's not there, we better ask ourselves why. You know, and so over the next several weeks, you know, I'm gonna be talking about the spirit filled life, what it means. Yes, praying in tongues, speaking in tongues is included. It is the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit. However, it is not the only evidence. You can pray in tongues all you want. And if it doesn't give you, if it doesn't lead you back to winning souls, you've missed something. And I'll tell you what we usually miss is because we find ourselves building our own kingdom. All of a sudden, we have desires of our own. We pray about all these desires, all these needs. We pray about all of our stuff ahead of the desire to win souls. If you think your greatest need compares to the need of a lost soul, you're deceived. You're deceived. Listen, all these things will be added to you. Listen, the key to prospering God's way is not pursuing prosperity. Pursue the things that matter most to his kingdom. And God will always make sure you are abundantly fed. He will make sure you're abundantly housed. He will make sure that blessings financially will come to your life because you're not sitting there using all your faith on your prosperity and on your home and on your car and on your business. Listen, all I say any, any day of, of my life when I speak about prosperity, I just simply say 3130 Garfield Road is paid in full. That's the only statement that I make. You know, and uh, before my home was paid off, I would just call out my address. You know, I'd just call out my address and I'd say, our home is paid off in Jesus' name. And then, you know, when it was vehicles or whatever, i just say, well, this is paid off. I just consider it paid. I didn't sit there and labor with my faith and, oh, Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, we should be crying out for souls more than stuff. We should be desiring to lay hands on the sick more than we are pursuing stuff. Are you getting a hold of this? Be kingdom-minded, lay down your kingdom before God, and watch him work in your life. You wanna be promoted? Then seek his kingdom. You know, say, well, pastor, what do I do then? You know what? Fill the church. Fill the church. It is not my job to fill this church. It is your job to fill this church. 
if everybody, just think of, I mean, think about any given Sunday here. I mean, imagine if half of us just won one, just the people that are represented here tonight on a Wednesday night. If even half of those that are here tonight won one person to the Lord and got them hooked up to the local church, we'd have to build a new building. I mean, think about how quick it would just, you know, every seat would be filled. But how many Christians live year in, year out and never see or lead someone to Jesus and never see them planted in the house of God? You want God to use you? Be kingdom-minded. Get them saved. Be a witness. Understand that his kingdom is gonna be demonstrated through you. You get something out of this here tonight? Don't be offended. If you're offended, if you're walking always upset with somebody, if, if, if you're dealing with a situation in your life, there's always going to be something in your life that's not good enough. And it will be like a worm in your mind and it'll just kind of eat you up and get you always thinking about how something's not good enough. If you're not careful, this church won't be good enough for you. If you're always complaining, the devil will always make sure to, to point out all the shortcomings of everything in your life. You know, guess what? There's gonna be shortcomings in this church institution. There's gonna be shortcomings with me personally as your pastor. There's no such thing as a pastor who doesn't have a weakness. There's no such thing as leadership of any organization that doesn't you know, miss something or not see it or disagree with you or whatever. But folks, you're gonna have to just understand that when somebody's in leadership, you're gonna have to trust them. You're gonna have to trust at some point, and of course I always say this, trust this first. But you understand there's just gonna be times, but when we're building the kingdom of God together, we're not sitting there pointing out someone's faults. You know, looking for, oh, they didn't do this, or this isn't good enough for me, I don't like that. If you're offended all the time, I can tell you why. Because you're building your own stuff. You're building your own kingdom. If you want to get away from offense, start building God's kingdom. And then when somebody steps on your preferences or does something you don't like, you don't even care. You don't even, <laughs> you just don't care. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and praise you tonight. Blessed is your name. Father, we see in Acts chapter two all the way to the end of Acts chapter five, we see there wasn't a complaint. There wasn't anyone upset. No one was offended. Actually, just the opposite. They were winning souls, getting people healed, giving away houses and lands, feeding the poor. They were on fire for you. And none of them said that any of the things which they possessed were their own. They got so kingdom-minded because they got filled with the Holy Ghost. They laid down their own kingdom. And Lord God, we just say that we want to be that way. Lord, I want to be that believer. Father, we see that if we're offended and we see later on that offense and complaining entered the church and we see how the apostles handled it. They just simply put somebody who was kingdom-minded over that department. The complainers didn't get promoted but those that were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom got promoted. And Father, you gave that church examples to follow, to look and to find those that were in their midst who were kingdom-minded for you. Father, we want to be that. Lord, I can speak for myself. I want to be that. Lord, I believe I can speak for just about everybody here. We want to be that. Father, that's our heart desire. Father, give us such a deep-seated desire for the lost. Give us a deep-seated desire for your kingdom. Father, like that bird that you put an instinct, you put something in that bird to draw them back across the entire planet, year in and year out. Father, keep drawing us back to this desire for the lost. Keep drawing us back for this desire to see people healed, and saved and set in the local church. Give us a desire for those that are hurting, to feed those that are hungry. Father, we want to be that living example, just like your people from Acts chapter two through Acts chapter five. Father, I want that. I want it. 
We praise you, Lord, tonight. We glorify you, Lord. Let's all stand to our feet and just worship the Lord for a moment before we dismiss. Father, we bless you tonight. We glorify you, Lord God. We glorify you, Lord God. Father, if any of us are building our own kingdoms, then Lord, reveal it to us. Lord, even the things that you've called me to do, I set before you. Father, anything in my life, anything that I'm to do, anything I'm to be, anything that I have within my possession, Lord, I just set it before you. Father, I set it before you. I believe this church will do the same in their own personal lives. Father, if there be something in my life that's not of you, then burn it up. Burn it up. Reveal it to me. That I may lay it down, get rid of it, give it away, whatever it is. Lord, we thank you that you bless our lives. You give us things that we can richly enjoy. But Father, anything that's not of you, I want it to go. Father, if there's anything that is not of you in this church, Father, as a, as a, as a whole, as a church family, if something's not of you, then Lord, I pray I pray that it would be changed. I pray that it would go. We'll make those changes, Lord God. Show it to us. Reveal it to us. Father, we humble ourselves before you. We have a tender heart, a cut heart. We bless you, Lord God. We worship you. Come on, everybody. Let's just worship him. Father, you are holy, Lord God. 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 Oh, blessed is your name. Blessed is your name. Father, I just trust that your spirit is revealing to us, if any, if anything in our lives where we're building our own kingdom, you'll show it to us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you've been so faithful to do that in my life so many times. Things that I started to pursue, directions I started to go that, that were not you. They weren't wrong, they just weren't you. And so that's what made them wrong. Father, we just submit ourselves to you. We'll lay it down. Father, I thank you that your hand is upon each one here tonight. Father, you are holy and good. We worship you. Father, give us that heart for the lost. Give us that heart for people in our lives. Father, that if we would go out, just those that are in this room and find that one, bring them to Christ. Set them in the church. Look over them and stop looking over our stuff. Stop looking over our needs all the time and start looking upon the needs of others. Lord, you will meet our needs when we are fulfilling the needs of your kingdom. We just bless you tonight. Worship you, Father. Worship you, Father. Worship you, Father. Worship you, Father. Worship you, Lord God. Father, we just give you all the praise, all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Folks, we're gonna receive tonight's offering here in just a moment. Just remember, uh, uh, make a note. Next week, we will not be here on Wednesday night. We'll pick it up the following Wednesday. Praise the Lord. Hey, don't forget, coming up May 23rd, 24th, and 25th, it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, Reverend Greer is gonna be right here in our church. Folks, do not miss it, all right? If you wanna be ministered to uh, by a spirit-filled you know, man of God, uh, there you go, praise the Lord. We're just excited about that. And so don't forget those things. Mark them down and be here. Let's go ahead and pray as we go ahead and receive tonight's offering. Father God, we just love you. We thank you for this opportunity to sow good seed into good ground. Father, we thank you that you abundantly provide those things. Father, you know what we have need of before we do. Lord, you're faithful. You meet those needs. You never let us down. You're always there for us. And Father, we just give you the praise, the glory, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Brothers, you may serve the people. Folks, once the offering goes by, you can go ahead and be dismissed. Just